Hey guys, and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we will be talking about a very interesting topic, and that is pancreatitis. So let's get started. So before we get into the specifics of pancreatitis itself, let's do a quick review on what is the pancreas and what are its functions. So the pancreas is a large gland which is located just behind the stomach and next to the small intestine. And as we can see in this image, it's located just behind the stomach and next to the small intestine. So it is responsible for releasing powerful digestive enzymes, such as amylase and lipase, into the small intestine to facilitate the digestive process. So these little enzymes that the pancreas releases actually facilitate the digestive process. So the breaking down of the different fats and the proteins, etc. And without them, the food we ingest won't be able to digest properly. The pancreas is also responsible for releasing insulin and glucagon into the bloodstream and these hormones control how the body uses food for energy. So this is basically where the pancreas is situated in the body and as we can see it's an exocrine gland because it secretes the pancreatic juice which is made up of the digestive enzymes and it also has an endocrine function because it secretes insulin and glucagon which controls the levels of blood sugar in the body. So now that we know what the pancreas is, let's take a close look at what is pancreatitis. So pancreatitis is the inflammation of the pancreas, and this may occur when the digestive enzymes begin working before the pancreas even releases them. So I wanna go back to the image before. So the pancreas is made up of multiple cells, which are called the Achini cells, and they are responsible in secreting the pancreatic juice. And once the pancreatic juice is secreted, it actually drains into the duodenum. But what actually happens in patients who suffer from pancreatitis is that the drainage process into the duodenum is either inhibited or stopped or doesn't occur. And when this doesn't occur, these digestive enzymes actually start digesting the pancreatic organ itself. These are very strong enzymes and they usually digest the food we intake, but if there's a blockage or something prevents the digestive juice from leaving the pancreas, it'll actually stay within the pancreas, become so concentrated and actually begin to digest the pancreatic organ itself. So this actually leads to the inflammation of the organ and the organ becoming fibrotic and essentially failing. So there are two main types of pancreatitis. The first one is called acute pancreatitis and this is sudden inflammation, which usually lasts a short time, and patients with acute pancreatitis will get better, and the disease will usually settle over several days after treatment. We then have patients who will suffer from chronic pancreatitis, and this is a longer lasting inflammation of the pancreatic gland, and here the gland does not heal or improve. Instead, the inflammatory process here just worsens over time. So this is basically what the healthy pancreas looks like, and this is what the pancreatitis or inflamed pancreas looks like. So now let's take a closer look at the causes for acute and chronic pancreatitis. So acute pancreatitis is usually caused by autoimmune diseases, drinking lots of alcohol, infections, gallstones, medications, metabolic disorders, surgery, or trauma. So anything that may inhibit the channels that drain the digestive juices into the intestine or anything that affects the pancreatic organ itself may contribute to the development of an acute pancreatitis. So if we have a gallstone, for example, it can actually block the common bile duct after the pancreatic duct has joined. This will actually inhibit the proper drainage of the digestive fluid and therefore it'll pull here and eventually lead to a pancreatitis. So any infections, medications that may block the channels or autoimmune attack that may block the channels or the drainage ducts can also contribute to an acute pancreatitis. So some of the causes of chronic pancreatitis include long-time alcohol use, cystic fibrosis, a family history of pancreatic disorders, gallstones, high triglyceride levels, and some certain medications. Something to point out here is that patients who consume alcohol chronically or in great amounts, usually suffer from a chronic pancreatitis. And this can actually lead to pancreatic cancer over time. So what are the signs and symptoms of pancreatitis? So the first thing the patient usually complains of is upper abdominal pain. And the abdominal pain usually radiates to the back of the patient. And the abdominal pain is usually worse after eating because that's when our pancreas is stimulated to release the digestive juices. 
The patient may also suffer from fever, rapid pulse, nausea, vomiting, tenderness when touching the abdomen, weight loss, and oily smelling stools, which is called steatorrhea. So now let's talk about the diagnosis of pancreatitis. So the first thing we can do is a blood test, and this is done to measure the two digestive enzymes, amylase and lipase. High levels of these two enzymes usually indicate an active pancreatitis. We can also do a pancreatic function test, and here the pancreas is stimulated to verify if it's making the right amounts of digestive enzymes. We can also use imaging techniques such as ultrasound, CT scan, and MRI scans, which gather images of the pancreatic organ. So any sort of inflammation or enlargement will suggest a pancreatic disease or a pancreatitis. We can also do ERCP, and here the physician will use a long tube with a camera at the end to look at the pancreatic and bile ducts in case any gallstones or strictures are present. So stricturing is the narrowing of the ducts, or we can also have any gallstones that may be present within these ductal systems. So anything that can cause a delay or a blockage in that flow of digestive enzymes into the duodenum will go on to cause a pancreatitis. So the ERCP process will help us to diagnose any strictures or stones that may be present there. We can also do a biopsy of the pancreas, and here a needle is used to remove a small piece of tissue from the patient's pancreas so that further studies may be conducted. And we can also do stool sampling. So patients with pancreatitis will also suffer from increased levels of fat in the stool and a lack of enzymes due to pancreatic damage results in poor digestion and absorption of food, especially fats. And as we mentioned earlier, they will have steatorrhea, which is the high amounts of fat in their stool. So now let's talk about the treatment of pancreatitis. So in acute pancreatitis, the patient will be hospitalized and the following treatment will be administered. So antibiotics if their pancreas is infected, an IV line for fluids, which is given through a needle, and a low-fat diet or fasting. So the patient will be instructed to stop eating so that their pancreas can recover. And this is called nil by mouth. So during this period, they will receive nutrition from a feeding tube. The patient will also be administered some pain medication to ease their discomfort. And gallbladder surgery will be done if gallstones are the reason for their pancreatitis and pancreatic surgery to clean out any fluid or dead tissue surrounding the pancreas. The treatment in chronic pancreatitis. So here patients will require insulin to treat their diabetes. So usually if we have long-term inflammation and failure of the organ, we're going to have reduced amounts of insulin being produced because the pancreas is responsible for producing the insulin in the body. So we will now have to supplement this by giving the patient insulin. So insulin will be administered to treat the patient's diabetes. They will also receive pain medication to ease any of their discomfort. They will also receive pancreatic enzymes to help their body get enough nutrients from the food they ingest. So if that organ is severely damaged and diseased, it also won't produce the enzymes, so they'll have to be supplemented in other ways. And surgery or procedures to relieve pain, help with drainage, or to treat any blockages the patient might have. Now let's briefly talk about the complications of pancreatitis. So pancreatitis can lead to potentially fatal complications, which include the obstruction of the bile and pancreatic duct, leakage from the pancreatic duct, pseudocysts with a risk of rupture, hemorrhage or infection, damage to the pancreas resulting in organ failure, pleural effusion, heart, lung and kidney failure. So in some severe cases, organ failure can occur as rapidly as 48 hours after symptoms appear. And without proper treatment, this can lead to death. It is therefore important to seek treatment as soon as possible if someone shows signs of acute pancreatitis. So in chronic pancreatitis, we have the pancreatic ascites, which means the fluid build up around the pancreas. And this may go on to cause a fistula, which is a sort of channel or drainage system into the lungs. And this will cause a pleural effusion, which is the collection of fluid around the lungs. And this could also lead to acute renal failure in the patient. And that brings us to the end of this video on pancreatitis. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Hope you found the presentation very informative and interesting. Please make sure you turn on your bell notification so you'll be notified every time we have a new upload. And if you'd like to download a copy of this presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.